Um, as you uh, may have heard uh, earlier this morning, the Supreme Court delivered its judgment on the Lord Advocate's reference, seeking clarity on whether or not the Scotland Act 1998 allows the Scottish Parliament to legislate for a referendum on independence. First of all, while I am obviously very disappointed by it, I do respect and accept the judgment of the court. In securing Scotland's independence, we will always be guided by a commitment to democracy and respect for the rule of law. That is a principle, an important principle, but of course it also reflects a practical reality. The route we take must be lawful and democratic for independence to be achieved. And as is becoming clearer by the day, achieving independence is not now just desirable, it is essential if Scotland is to escape the disaster of Brexit, the damage of policies imposed by governments we do not vote for, and the low growth, high inequality economic model that is holding us back. However, we must be clear today that the Supreme Court does not make the law, it interprets and applies the law. If the devolution settlement in the Scotland Act is inconsistent with any reasonable notion of Scottish democracy, as now seems to be the case, that is the fault of Westminster lawmakers, not the justices of the Supreme Court. In addressing the implications of today's ruling, it's also important to be mindful of what the court was not asked to decide and therefore what the ruling does not tell us. The court was not asked to decide if there is a democratic mandate for a referendum. The mandate and the parliamentary majority for a referendum is quite simply undeniable. Nor was the court asked if Scotland should be independent, only the Scottish people can be the judge of that. And it was not asked if there is any democratic means by which Scotland can choose independence. The question the court was asked to decide, indeed the only question the court could reasonably answer, was a narrower one. Would a bill providing for an advisory referendum on independence be within the current powers of the Scottish Parliament? In other words, can the Scottish Parliament legislate for an independence referendum without the prior agreement of Westminster? Now, as uh, we know, the court has answered that question in the negative. It has determined that under the Scotland Act 1998, which of course encapsulates the current devolution settlement, even an advisory referendum asking the question, should Scotland be an independent country, is a matter reserved to the Westminster Parliament. What that means is that without an agreement between the Scottish and UK governments for either a Section 30 order or a UK Act of Parliament to change its powers, the Scottish Parliament cannot legislate for the referendum that the people of Scotland have instructed it to deliver. That is a hard pill for any supporter of independence and surely indeed for any supporter of democracy to swallow. However, as I said back in June when I informed Parliament that the Lord Advocate had agreed to make this reference, it was always the case that in the absence of an agreement with the UK government, the question of the Scottish Parliament's competence in relation to a referendum would end up in the Supreme Court, if not before legislation, then certainly after any decision by Parliament to pass a bill. So while it is, uh, I think, a statement of the obvious that this is not the outcome I hoped for, it does give us clarity. And having that clarity sooner rather than later allows us now to plan a way forward, however imperfect that might be. Now, I am enough of a realist to know that the immediate questions posed by today's judgment will be for me and the SNP. That is entirely understandable. I'm also long enough in the political tooth to expect some triumphalism on the part of unionist politicians. However, unionists of a more thoughtful disposition, and yes, I do believe they exist, uh, will, I suspect, know that to be misguided. Indeed, they will have been hoping that the court, as the UK government asked it to do, would have declined to answer the substantive question today. That's because they will understand that this judgment raises profound 
and deeply uncomfortable questions about the basis and the future of the United Kingdom. Until now, it has been understood and accepted by opponents of independence as well as by its supporters that the UK is a voluntary partnership of nations. The Royal Commission on Scottish Affairs back in 1950 said this, Scotland is a nation and voluntarily entered into the Union as a partner. That sentiment was echoed nearly 60 years later by the Kalman Commission, which described the UK as a voluntary union and partnership. And it was reinforced in 2014 by the Smith Commission, which made clear that nothing in its report prevented Scotland becoming an independent country should the people of Scotland so choose. What today's ruling tells us, however, is that the Scotland Act does not, in fact, uphold that long-held understanding of the basis of the relationships that constitute the UK. On the contrary, it shatters that understanding completely. Let's be absolutely blunt. A so-called partnership in which one partner is denied the right to choose a different future, or even to ask itself the question, cannot be described in any way as voluntary or even a partnership at all. So this ruling confirms that the notion of the UK as a voluntary partnership of nations, if it ever was a reality, is no longer a reality. And that exposes a situation that is quite simply unsustainable. I don't often, as all of you know, quote uh, former Tory Prime Ministers, but I will make an exception today. In the words of former Tory Prime Minister John Major, no nation can be held irrevocably in a union against its will. Indeed, perhaps what today's judgment confirms more than anything else is that the only guarantee for Scotland of equality within the British family of nations is through independence. That fact is now clearer than ever before. The immediate question, of course, is what happens now? Obviously, I'm making these remarks just a couple of hours after the court issued its judgment. While the terms and import of the ruling are clear, it will still be important to absorb and consider the full written judgment properly. I think it's safe to predict that this will not be my last word on the matter. However, my initial views, building on what I said in June, are as follows. First of all, it is worth repeating that the court judgment relates to one possible route to Scotland making a choice on independence, a referendum bill in the Scottish Parliament without Westminster agreement. While it is absolutely the case, if the UK was a voluntary partnership, that this would not be needed. It does remain open to the UK government, however belatedly, to accept democracy and reach agreement. I make clear again today, therefore, that I stand ready at any time to reach agreement with the Prime Minister on an adjustment to the devolution settlement that enables a lawful democratic referendum to take place, a process that respects the right of people in Scotland to choose our future in line with the clear mandate of the Scottish Parliament, lets politicians make the case for and against independence and crucially allows the Scottish people to decide. What I will not do, however, is go cap in hand. My expectation, in the short term at least, is that the UK government will maintain its position of outright democracy denial. That position is, in my view, not just unsustainable, it is also utterly self-defeating. The more contempt the Westminster establishment shows for Scottish democracy, the more certain it is that Scotland will vote yes when the choice does come to be made. As for that choice, and for the avoidance of any doubt, I believe today, just as I did yesterday, that a referendum is the best way to determine the issue of independence. The fact is, the SNP is not abandoning the referendum route. Westminster is blocking it. And in that scenario, unless we give up on democracy, and again, for the avoidance of any doubt, I, for one, I'm simply not prepared to do that. We must and we will find another democratic, lawful and constitutional means by which the Scottish people can express their will. In my view, that can only be an election. The next national election scheduled for Scotland 
is, of course, the UK general election, making that both the first and the most obvious opportunity to seek what I described back in June as a de facto referendum. As with any proposition in any party manifesto in any election, it is, of course, up to the people how they respond. No party can dictate the basis on which people cast their votes, but a party can be, indeed should be, crystal clear about the purpose for which it is seeking popular support. In this case, for the SNP, that will be to establish, just as in a referendum, majority support in Scotland for independence so that we can then achieve independence. That then is the principle. However, now that the Supreme Court's ruling is known and a de facto referendum is no longer hypothetical, it is necessary to agree the precise detail of the proposition we intend to put before the country. For example, the form our manifesto will take, the question we will pose, how we will seek to build support above and beyond the SNP, and what steps we will take to achieve independence if we win. Now, as you would expect, I have views on all of that. However, given the magnitude of these decisions for the SNP, the process of reaching them is one that the party as a whole must be fully and actively involved in. I can therefore confirm that I will be asking our National Executive Committee to convene a special party conference in the new year to discuss and agree the detail of a proposed de facto referendum. In the meantime, the SNP will launch and mobilise a major campaign in defence of Scottish democracy. For we should be in no doubt, as of today, democracy is what is at stake. This is no longer just about whether or not Scotland becomes independent, vital though that decision is. It is now more fundamental. It is now about whether or not we even have the basic democratic right to choose our own future. Indeed, from today, the independence movement is as much about democracy as it is about independence. Now, to conclude, before I take questions, of course, I am well aware that there will be a real sense of frustration and disappointment today in both the SNP and the wider movement. I share that. My message, though, is this. While that is understandable, it must be short-lived. And I believe it will be. Indeed, I suspect we will start to see just how short-lived and the strength of the gatherings planned for later today in Edinburgh and other parts of Scotland. The fact is, we have work to do. The case for Scotland becoming independent is more compelling and urgent than ever. Independence is now essential because of what Westminster control means on a day-to-day -day basis for people in this country now and for future generations. Thanks to Westminster control, the UK economy is in crisis and we're entering a new age of Tory austerity. Low-income households in the UK are now 20% poorer than their counterparts in France, 21% poorer than in Germany. Let me put that into context. That means the living standards of the lowest income households in the UK, including Scotland, are £3,800 lower than their French equivalents. Thanks to Westminster control, we are subject to an immigration and asylum system that neither works in practice nor serves our need to grow our population. It mistreats those who come to our shores looking for sanctuary from oppression and deprives us of the talents and the taxes of those who want to live, work and contribute to our country. Thanks to Westminster control, even the limited measure of self-government that devolution provides is no longer guaranteed. The steady erosion of the powers of our parliament, the undermining of the Sewell Convention, the imposition of the UK Internal Market Act and now the retained EU law bill. And if we stick with Westminster control, we are stuck outside the European Union permanently. And that comes at a heavy cost. According to the Office for Budget Responsibility, Brexit will mean in the long run a fall in national income of 4% compared with EU membership. That's equivalent to a cut in public revenues in Scotland of £3.2 billion. All the main Westminster parties now support a Brexit that Scotland did not vote for. And the Brexit conspiracy of silence that exists between them means the UK economy will become weaker 
and people will pay a heavier and heavier price. That price will be paid in hard economic terms, but also in the narrowing of horizons and loss of opportunities for generations to come. Scotland can do better than this. The example of independent countries across Europe and the world, many with nowhere near the assets and strengths we have, tells us that loudly and clearly. We hear from Westminster that what is needed is stability. But let's be clear, the Westminster system has shown that it is not capable of securing stability. The people relying on food banks are not being offered stability. Those across our country, afraid to switch on their heating, are not being offered stability. The businesses struggling with Brexit are not being given stability. The young people denied the rights and opportunities of EU membership are not being offered stability. A UK model that delivers low growth and low productivity, coupled with sky-high rates of poverty and inequality, does not and never will offer stability. Scotland can do so much better. So yes, of course, this judgment is a disappointment, but it is not one we can or will wallow in. Indeed, getting the judgment now rather than later gives us the clarity we need to <coughs> plot a definite way forward. Fundamentally, our job in the independence movement today is the same as it was yesterday. It is to persuade, persuade a majority of the Scottish people of the fact that independence is the best future for Scotland and ensure a democratic process that allows majority support to be established beyond doubt. That job is not easy, I know. On some days, like today perhaps, it feels more difficult than ever. But nothing, absolutely nothing worth doing is ever easy. There is no doubt whatsoever in my mind that independence will be worth it. And my resolve to achieve independence is as strong as it has ever been. Indeed, it is, if anything, today even stronger. Prosperity, equality, internationalism, and now, without any doubt, the very democracy of our nation depends on independence. Thank you all very much indeed.